Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Casey from Brightcove. Um, I'm a product manager, uh, and my role is to uh, do a couple things. One, manage the uh, the media backbone services for Brightcove. So, Brightcove is a is a online video platform, uh, and on top of that platform, there are many services that compose the online video experience. In addition to that, I'm also in charge of API design for those media backbone services. Uh, so we're going to talk today about um, how we came up with our API design for Zencoder specifically, uh, and how Brightcove is thinking about API design for the future. Um, so as I mentioned, Brightcove is an online video platform. Been around since 2004 and basically invented the space of online video. Uh, platforms. Um, and it's interesting because Brightcove in 2004 created a product that was targeted at uh, a certain set of users. And the video user in 2004 was a person that wanted to take a source video, uh, upload it, and push it out to websites. It was as simple as that. They didn't need complex deployments. They just wanted to be able to play video back on the web. Uh, in 2013, it's a much different world. And what we've seen is, as video becomes ubiquitous, uh, the type of users that want to engage with video and use video uh, are much different. They're developers. They're people that want to take a set of underlying services and compose that into a uh, unique solution that's specific for their needs. Um, so last year, uh, Brightcove purchased a company called Zencoder. Zencoder is an API-based cloud transcoding platform. There's a couple reasons why Brightcove purchased Zencoder. Uh, the first reason was as video continues to um, be available on more devices, more places, uh, the amount of encoding that has to be done is greatly increasing. So something like 10,000% increases over a, a, a span of only a few years. Uh, means that Brightcove now needed a cloud-based platform that could encode uh, one video as fast as it can encode 100,000 videos. But I think, I think the more important reason that Brightcove purchased Zencoder is because Zencoder is an API-only product, uh, which means that as, uh, as creators of that product, we had to think about the API as our product. That's all we have. And if people don't enjoy our API and don't like working with it, then we don't have anything to sell to people. And increasingly, in 2013, Brightcove understands that developers are our future. And we have to have an API-first strategy. So right now at Brightcove, uh, learning from the example that Zencoder set, every single product that's created must be created with an API first. That's, that's an absolute must across the board. If you do not create a product with an API first, you're going to have a stern talking to at Brightcove. So everybody here, obviously, I hope, knows what API stands for. Um, I always mess up the first two letters, so I'm only going to say the last one, which is interface. Uh, when we look at API, uh, we look at other interfaces. How do people engage with interfaces? And Kickstarter, for example, any website is an interface. It's a way that people use to communicate and, and to understand how to interact with a service. So in this case, you have a menu bar, you have some images. These are all, these are all parts of language that have been developed over the last 15 or 20 years of, of online web services that are sort of a common language that people understand. APIs are exactly the same. APIs are a set of interfaces that people can communicate with. Um, so when we look at an API, we think about two users. Uh, the first user is, is a computer program that's going to be talking to the API, uh, interacting with it. And that's a separate set of needs from the other user, who is a developer. This is a, a flesh, and, flesh and blood real person who has feelings and has reactions to how something works. We need to think about both. <clears throat> so. Uh, the, the computer programmer user, when we ask what, or the computer program, uh, when we ask what they want, they just want consistency. They want something that works. It wants it to not break. It wants to always be able to work with it. This user wants, of course, the same thing, but they also want a service that's, that's nice, that's good to use. They want something that's beautiful and, and something that's attractive. So we try to do that with our design. And, and the, the end goal of that is to create a language that's just as interactive and just as much of an interface as, as any great website is, or any product for that matter. So uh, a couple of the, the things that informed our decision-making process as we developed our API uh, were Dieter Realms and uh, the Kano model. <clears throat> so Dieter Realms uh, informs 
industrial design, that reflects um, how we make design dis decisions with the API. And the Kano model is a way of looking at product and a way of making decisions about what you want to support within your product. Uh, and that led us to five guiding principles. So we'll talk about the five guiding principles um, along with some specific examples. And, uh, and then if there's any time left, I talk kind of slowly, so there may not be time left, but uh, if there's any time left, we'll have a short discussion. So the five guiding principles. First, minimalism. Uh, if one line will do, there should only be one line. And uh, it should be simple. Uh, an input is an input. That's it. It doesn't need to be any more complex than that. Uh, get out of the way. So the way we get out of the way is we build on top of standards. So RESTful interfaces, everybody understands REST. It's really easy to use. Um, and we try to be consistent. So we fail in consistent ways, and we work in consistent ways. And people can trust us when they're inter interacting with us. So uh, Dieter Rams was the chief design officer at Braun. Uh, and he was the mentor to Jonathan Ive, who is the chief designer for uh, Apple. Uh, so here's a, here's a quick statement that, uh, that Jonathan Ive made about um, his first experience with a Dieter Rams design product. When I was a young boy growing up in London, my parents bought a wonderful juicer. It was a Braun MPZ2 Citromatic H. I knew nothing about Dieter Rams or his 10 principles of good design. But to a little boy uninterested in juicing, I remember the Citromatic he and his team designed for Braun with shocking clarity. It was white, it felt cold and heavy, the surfaces were out without apology, bold, pure, perfectly proportioned, coherent, and effortless. There was an honest connection between its blemish-free surfaces and the materials from which they were made. It was clearly made with the best materials, not the cheapest. At a glance, you knew exactly what it was and exactly how to use it. It was the essence of juicing made material, a static object that perfectly described the process by which it worked. It felt complete and it felt right. So if we think about what the chief designer at Apple would do if he had to make a juicer, we might imagine something like this, which was made in the 1960s, has a nice polished plastic white design, it's really simple. Looks like something Apple might design. Uh, and that's not the only example of, of similarities. Um, across the board, uh, Apple has been clearly, uh, clearly influenced by Braun's uh, industrial design. Um, if you have a chance to, to watch um, uh, a video called Objectified from 2009, it has uh, a sample of Dieter Rams giving a speech about his 10 guiding principles. It's really great. Um, so some of his guiding principles, good design makes a product useful. Uh, so our, our product is, is a series of really complex stuff going on. We, we dynamically scale the cloud up and down in order to handle transcoding demand. We have a pipeline of, of uh, really intense uh, video encoding that we're doing. And it's, it's a lot of tools working together seamlessly. Uh, our API design is meant to make that easy to interface with. So you don't have to worry about being an expert at video. You can still do hundreds of thousands of videos uh, and build a YouTube-like service, for example, uh, overnight. Uh, the next guiding principle is to design for extremes. So we want to design for the power user. We want to design for the Windows programmer. And uh, we want to design for the, for the guy who maybe thinks he knows a whole lot, but maybe doesn't know a ton. So we want to design for the wrong customer. And we want to design to be highly scalable. So we, don't, we want to design to do a single video really well, really quickly, but we should also be able to handle hundreds of thousands of hours of video uh, on a single day. Um, but every once in a while, there's a customer that you can't design for, and you just have to uh, forget about that customer to a certain extent. Um, you try to solve everybody's problems, but uh, you have to try to make the best decisions. Uh, especially in the world of video, it's really easy for someone to encode a video that's going to break and not play on devices. We need to do the right thing, and we need to be prescriptive in how we offer our services. We're the professionals, and for professionals, we give them good tools to use our service, but we don't want to break. It, it doesn't make any sense for us to encode a video that's not going to play back on any device. Uh, here's a quick email from someone that was really upset with our service. Uh, we tried our best to make him happy, but, uh, but no matter what we did, he, he was upset. And we can't, we can't service this customer. Some customers we just have to forget about. Good design is aesthetic. Uh, quick example of that, this is Hungarian notation. It's probably the ugliest way you can write code. Um, and if you compare that to something that, sorry, I'm sure that's, uh, that's painful for you. But it, it is pretty ugly, right? 
uh, compared to something that like someone, someone like me, who's not a, um, programming genius can understand like Ruby. It's, it's a uh, human language. I can read it and I can kind of understand what, what's being said. Good design makes a product understandable. So with our API, let's say someone sends us a couple things that don't really make any sense. So API key does not exist. There's a few ways we can fail. One, we can just say internal server error. I have no idea what this means. If we say unauthorized, that's a little bit better. Now I know there's an issue authenticating. Even better would, would be to say, what's the exact issue? Give an error message. And this error message can be something like API key not found. And we can also say, you know, what was the specific issue if there were specific issues with, a, with the API key? So the API key can't include spaces. Uh, even better than that, we can give a link to the API. So someone can go to that uh, link and, uh, and see their API and fix the problem. Uh, and then even if they have that fixed, there could still be some other problems. So we could say bad request. Uh, and even better is we can tell them exactly why the request is bad. We can tell them that the JSON is not valid. There's a syntax error. And that helps the customer get onboarded more quickly. Good design is honest. It doesn't pretend to do something it can't do. It does only what it can do. Um, so uh, we give clear responses, and we're consistent about those responses. We don't try to, to cover up server service errors. Um, if, if something's broken, we tell people it's broken. Good design is unobtrusive. Um, so there's a video you can watch of, of Jonathan Ive talking about um, what, a, what, a good, uh, what a good interface does. Unfortunately, we don't have sound. But basically, what he's saying is um, good design is being minimal. And, uh, and if there are indicator lights, for example, the indicator light should indicate something. And if it's not indicating something useful, then it's getting in the way. And it's, uh, it's wasteful. We try to do the same thing with our API design. Good design is long lasting, so it's not fashionable, it's not cool, it does what's useful, and it does, uh, it does its job. So, for example, have a clean URL that's really simple to understand. Good design is as little design as possible. Again, minimalism, just keep our API simple and don't try to do too much. Um, the next guiding principle is be predictable. So if we imagine what users are going, going to do with our service, we want it to feel like they designed the service themselves. Uh, so for example, if, if we look at Stripe and we try to imagine what would a banking service look like? Like, let's think about how, how would we charge customers? How would we build a banking API? Um, what is the URL? What are the parameters? And if you think about it, it it's actually pretty obvious. You have to have these things. And if you're trying to inter integrate with this service, because it's predictable, things feel natural to you. It feels like it just works. Um, the, so that, that's, our, that's our design ethos. Um, we also have, uh, we were also informed by something called the Kano model, which is um, by Noriaki Kano. Um, this is what he actually looks like. Uh, he's a Japanese researcher who studied product design. Uh, and studied products and defined how people engage with products and, uh, and how people are excited or conversely not excited by, by products. And what he found is um, there, there are a few metrics that people use to, to understand products and, and how, they, uh, how they consume products. The first is um, basic needs. Basic needs are just must, must haves. If you don't have a basic need, then uh, you don't have a service. Uh, people don't get excited about it. It's just something that has to be there. It's like having a, a bus driver that's a safe driver. You don't get excited about having a safe driver, but you kind of need to have it. If you don't have a safe driver, you have problems. Uh, performance needs are a linear uh, are are linear increases in satisfaction, and that's having features. So uh, what this says is that. For, for features, you can, you can add new features, and that, that increases satisfaction sort of linearly. But in the end, people don't really care. The interesting thing that the Kano model found and that his research found is that you can have every single feature in the world and do, do all those features. People just don't care about that. They're not moved by it. They don't have a, an emotional reaction to feature sets. What people are moved by are something called delighters. And they're moved in an in a exponential way. The more delight the more delightful things that you have, 
the more excited people are, and that's exponential with how they interact with your product. So to the extent that you can add really exciting new features and, and things that no one else in the world is doing, even if it's not directly related to your core product, that will change the way people experience your product and how satisfied people are. Um, so so for, for Zencoder specifically, a couple of the things that we did um, that, were, that delighted users and made users excited were uh, to create what we call the request builder. Um, so the request builder allows you to go into Zencoder and one at a time start playing with um, the API directly. And as you play with the API and, and choose new settings, uh, we create the request and you can actually execute that request and see a video uh, encoded, um, which is really powerful. We're trying to get to that aha moment um, where people interact with the service and has a result and sees how powerful the service is. And the faster and the smoother you can get someone to that aha moment, the better off you're going to do. We also have great documentation. So every single feature that we release has to be documented, has to have really clear documentation. Otherwise, it's not, uh, it's not released. It's in beta or not even at beta. So let me read uh, really quickly a, uh, um, a quote from one of our customers. Uh, this is actually a tweet or a series of tweets. But um, I know the following statement is going to sound dramatic, but it's the truth. Zencoder seriously uplifted my entire day. The API is really well designed and has documentation for not only what each value should be, but also what an example input and output would look like using the value. I had spent the earlier part of the day working with a web service that is the complete opposite of those things. So when I started digging into Zencoder, I felt like I was witnessing a double rainbow. Then when I found the API builder, it went beyond a double rainbow to a level I can only imagine is equal to witnessing a unicorn birth. So we spent a lot of time we spent a lot of time on, uh, on features that aren't core to the product, but would, would make people excited and happy to use us. And, and the result is um, we want a lot of developers over. And uh, that, that helped Zencoder grow exponentially. Um, the difficulty of, of delighters, and this is sort of what the, what the focus of the, the presentation is on, is that as delighters, uh, as delighters are released, and if you're really successful with them, and people enjoy what you're doing, other people are going to take those inventions, and then delighters become basic needs. Especially when we're talking about API-based services, you're providing a blueprint for everybody in the world to uh, copy your service. And you're providing the basic insight into what your service does. The easier it is you make, people to, you make it for people to integrate with you, the easier it is for them to copy you which means that the faster these delighters become just basic needs and they become commoditized. And for all of us, we have to find ways to look beyond um, managing our products as incremental increases, product, product increases. And we need to think about the new things that we can do to constantly delight people. We need to find the revolution that's gonna happen for our core services that are gonna enable a, a whole, that's going to enable a whole new way for people to interact with, uh, with our services. So what, what we decided is, rather than focus on having every single feature, uh, we want to focus on delight and performance. And in the end, we want to excite users. That's, that's what it's all about. And the more excited users you have, the more customers you have. So what do you think? Yeah? You like that? What, what APIs are great? What strikes you as being like an, an exciting API that you've interacted with re recently? Anything. Nothing. It's not exciting. Does, does, anybody, does anybody have an example of something you've created to try to excite people with your API? That's absolutely right. So um, this is something we're, we're dealing with right now, which is uh, we released our, our live product um, 
a live product six months ago, and, uh, and it's taken off really quickly. And what we've noticed is supporting live, for example, is totally different than supporting file-based downloads because it's, it's a live event that's happening. And, and live events, uh, if something happens on the live event, whether it's your fault or not, it's, it's very obvious that something's happening and it's an emergency right away. So, so building support out and building documentation for that was the most important thing that we did. And it's, it's absolutely right. Providing good documentation and good features for people to, to begin interfacing with your services is really important. I mean, that, that can be an exciting feature in and of itself. The, the API builder that we have genuinely excites people. There, there are people that, that have that are that have a video background, not necessarily a programming background, that went to the went to the the um, API builder and started playing with it to encode a video, and became sort of tinkerer programmers after that as a result because it's it's their first uh, interaction with creating a JSON object, for example, something like that, and can be really powerful. Is there is there any difference between the the APIs that you create internally versus the APIs you create externally, and how do you manage that difference? Has anybody had any experience with that? It may not be quite as uh, picky with the names you choose for internals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So naming is not as much of an issue for internal APIs. Yeah. Or it should be, but uh, time constraints are often more. Um, yeah. How good, than good design. How, how large? How many people in interact with your internal APIs? Uh, mostly services, actually. Uh, yeah. But behind those services, I guess uh, somewhere between 100 and 700 people. Yep, that's, that's quite a lot. So, so they're 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 still consuming that service. It's it's quite a few users, and uh, so so you can be a little bit. I mean, you could you can make jokes, for example, for your names and stuff like that. But but you still have to make something that's pretty usable. But I guess you're not as concerned about uh, about how smooth those names are consumed by uh, by external users. Any other questions? Thanks for your time. Appreciate it.